So this quote is from Angela McDougall, uh, who's the executive director of the Battered Women's Support Services, EWSS. Uh, we have a pandemic on top of a pandemic, um, she recently said in an interview with CTV. The COVID-19 pandemic has been linked to spikes in domestic violence reports and crisis calls all over the world, including China, France, and the UK. The impact of the virus's spread on women has already been documented by the Center for Global Development and the UN, both citing economic insecurity, increased social isolation, and the inability for women to leave abusive situations as reasons for the increase in violence. The pandemic is shining light on a prevalence of domestic violence in Canada as well, with shelters struggling to keep up with calls from women in danger. One in 10 women say they are very or extremely concerned about the possibility of violence in their home due to the stress of confinement. According to Statistics Canada survey about the impacts of COVID-19 released in early April. Bringing it back to our work here in BC with refugees and refugee claimants, even before the pandemic, for the last few years actually, we've steadily been receiving requests from settlement agency representatives for trainings on how to support refugees and refugee claimants facing domestic violence, which brings us to our webinar today. And um, thankfully, in the last couple of years, we've been joined by Rosa from BWSS to provide us with training sessions. And we've also developed a toolkit together, which she'll review with you today in her presentation. <clears throat> so please welcome our first speaker today, um, Rosa Elena Artiga, who's manager of the direct services and clinical practice at Battered Women's Support Services. Rosa has been working in the anti-violence field for over 20 years, delivering workshops on violence against self-identified girls and women and providing training to service providers at the national and international level. In her role as manager of direct services and clinical practice, she oversees a number of programs with BWSS. Since 2008, Rosa has researched and addressed the issue of battered women being wrongfully arrested. She has been successful with a number of police complaints. She has addressed the is this issue at a systemic level. Rosa is wildly passionate about her work, which is framed in a decolonizing feminist anti-oppression practice. So welcome Rosa, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to the BC Refugee Hub for inviting me. And um, I'm going to share uh, my PowerPoint. And I know that maybe some of the people who are today uh, participating in this uh, presentation already are familiar with the tool that we developed with the Refugee Hub. So on uh, my PowerPoint, I only going to go really briefly through some areas of this uh, tool because uh, of time. I know we don't have much time, uh, but you always can go back to um, check the tool and maybe if you have done a, some training before, you may have access to the full uh, PowerPoint that I have shared in the past. So I'm a, this tool was created specifically for refugee and immigrant women. But I have a, a huge commitment with women who are identified as non-status women or women with precarious uh, immigration status because uh, also what through the over 20 years I have been doing this work, I believe that uh, women who have precarious immigration status or identify as non-status uh, are women that uh, just because of the immigration law and the barriers that they face then they are more vulnerable to violence. And I think that we need to really support them and at least with information so they don't uh, have to be trapped in a situation that is very violent or abusive for so long. So uh, you are familiar uh, with Better Women's Support Services. We have been doing different presentations. I, I just want to say that we have many programs for self-identify girls, women, and femmes. We work with the LGBTQ community. Uh, today, I'm going to use some language that is, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, I have to talk more about men and women because what we see 
based on the criminal system is that a higher percentage of, well, I can give you the percentage, is 80% of the crimes committed against women and children are committed by men. Uh, so we need to acknowledge uh, the systemic oppression that women face. And BWSS has been doing this for over 40 years. Uh, I, I have a disclaimer, so the safety uh, assessment and safety planning tool that we develop has uh, many uh, tips, information, questions that you can ask to people that you are supporting. Uh, however, uh, don't use this tool as a way to provide uh, legal information or don't use this tool to make decisions for the, your clients. Uh, and as I said, uh, the tool uses a language uh, that is specifically for self-identified women. So through this tool, we address the safety concerns, safety risk assessment, safety planning, and we give you some resources. I know that some of you live outside of Vancouver and Metro Vancouver, so around the province, there are many shelters, transition houses, maybe uh, programs that provide uh, free legal services, uh, information, maybe some pro bono lawyers who are supporting uh, women who are experiencing domestic violence. So I really encourage you to build relationships with these communities and to gather information. So when you need to provide the support, you can call uh, your networks right away. Uh, and also I know the Refugee Hub have put together uh, a number of resources around the province and many links. So we need to go back to remember why uh, women who have precarious immigration status or are refugee claimants or are immigrant women uh, access our support. And uh, many of them uh, have been uh, threatened to be deported, right? And what we know is that part of the abuse that many immigrant refugee women experience in the relationship is that uh, a lot of the times the person who has the power, in this case men, um, they pretend to have information and they manipulate the information and then what they tell women is that uh, if you leave me or if you call the police or if you say anything about what's going on at home, I'm going to get you deported. And then if you are deported, uh, I'm going to keep the children and you won't see the children again. Um, so these are uh, discourses that are uh, towards maintain power and control over the woman, right? And we need to remember too that many uh, women, girls, uh, LGBTQ communities who have to leave their countries and come to Canada, uh, they come not because they are just having a trip or you ju they just want to take over jobs in, in Canada. The majority of people who access our supports have been forced to migrate. They have been displaced from their lands. There is gender persecution, right, because of being a woman, or if they identify as non-binary, trans woman, trans men. So because of gender persecution, they have to leave. Uh, many of the women who access our services, they have experienced sexual violence uh, uh, growing up. Uh, some oppressive cultural practices, because sometimes our cultures have a wealth of knowledge and values and things that are beautiful, but sometimes within different backgrounds, uh, we transfer ideas that are very oppressive and keep people trapped in abusive relationships. Uh, some women are trafficked, whether they know that they are going to be trafficked, but that's their only choice to access a better life, uh, or others are being lied. Uh, they are told that once that they are in Canada, they are going to have jobs and they are going to have access to documents. So what we have seen is that many women who access our services, they won't disclose that information uh, because of shame or because of fear of losing the only opportunity to stay in Canada. And the sponsorship, right? Uh, 
many women, whether they meet someone in their country who ha is a Canadian citizen and he marries her and offers to sponsor her, or when they come to Canada as a temporary worker or on a student visa, sometimes they meet a, a person, they get married, and then he offers uh, to sponsor her. However, a sponsorship is used as another tactic to maintain power and control. And we have seen that sometimes even the partner tells her, I have done all the documents and, and uh, I'm just waiting for immigration to let us know. Uh, and then later on, we find out that he never did anything, right? And she's left without a status and maybe now she has a baby. So all those factors uh, we need to take in consideration when we are supporting uh, people who access our services. And uh, you're familiar with this spiral of violence, so I'm just going to show you again briefly uh, that many girls and women who may be dealing with domestic violence and who are uh, also dealing with an immigration status that may create barriers for them, also, they have experienced other forms of abuse growing up. And what I can tell you is that at uh, Better Women Support Services, we see maybe 50% of the women who access our services uh, identify as non-status, uh, refugee or immigrant women, and we have different programs where we provide uh, support groups. And sometimes we show this spiral and many of them tell us, you know, I went through all of that. Like that spiral shows my life. So when we have thoughts about why women don't leave an abusive relationship, it could be that maybe even though she's dealing with this abuse in the intimate relationship, maybe that's the safest place that she has been able to find because growing up, maybe there was incest or a gender persecution or she was forced to work and uh, support the family. Uh, so when we uh, start uh, the safety assessment, also it's very important that uh, we acknowledge that people have different gender identities or gender presentations, and we need to be respect respectful of them. So on our assessment tool, we ask for gender identity and we ask for pronouns right and if the people take the risk to let you know that they identify as non-binary and they want to use the pronouns they and them it's very important to respect that and to follow their lead uh, when you first connect with a, a person who is disclosing that she is going through some form of abuse or violence uh, and you are going to make a safety plan, it's very important to make a plan even to call her back. And now with COVID, uh, we have been providing many appointments over the phone. And I imagine that in your different organizations, you have protocols about safety, right? And uh, what has been very hard is that uh, there have been situations where the woman has a full safety plan about what time she's going to call us, if she has her phone number um, blocked or, or if she wants us to unblock our phone number. We had an incident where when the woman was on the phone talking to us, uh, the, her partner who is abusive uh, started assaulting her. And then we, had, we told her, in this moment, we're going to call 911. I'm sorry that we have to do it. And she said, oh no, go ahead, do it. And then we called 911, the police went to her place. Uh, they communicated with us and they uh, asked this man to leave and, and continue their, their process. Um, so that was only one time in, within COVID time that we had to, to do that because uh, he just came into the room and, and he, didn't care, right? He didn't care about the criminal system. He just got violent towards her. So it's very important to ask the person if um, she wants you to call her, uh, if she wants you to block your number or your name, uh, to ask her if uh, she wants you to identify as 
Jenny or Maria, you know, and to use another name and, and if a man answers the phone, just to say, yeah, I am a community worker or I'm a, a social worker. Or Sometimes women tell us different ideas about how we can connect with them. Because sometimes if you don't have a safety plan just to call her back, that can put her at risk. Uh, again, it's very important that uh, before you start encouraging her to uh, take this step or, the, or this other step, that you find out about her immigration status and, uh, and that you get familiar. Again, you are not immigration lawyers, but something that has been very useful at BWSS is that the, everybody who works there understands what it means, temporary worker permit, and what are the barriers, what are the pros and cons. So get familiar with the different uh, areas of the law just for you to understand. Again, language, uh, you may speak the same language and that's great, but if you don't speak her language, uh, make sure that you find an interpreter uh, because many times women, uh, you know, they feel shame that they may not understand everything you say, and then they just pretend that they are understanding, but later on they take steps that maybe put them at risk. Uh, also, what is her income, right? Because as you know, uh, financial control is one of the factors that keeps a woman uh, in an abusive relationship. And again, during COVID, what we heard from many women was like, I don't have a place to go. Uh, I have called busy housing and now with COVID is full. One of the issues that we had back in March uh, when uh, people had to self-isolate and we were working remotely is that many transition houses and shelters were not accepting women because they were working on a protocol around uh, safety because of COVID, right? And uh, in our case, uh, we had, uh, through our networks, we were able to connect with a person who offered a hotel. Then we could send women to this hotel and we continue doing it even uh, until August. August is going to be the last month that we are going to be having access to the hotel, but we are trying to work on another plan because what we saw from March, March to August, that it was very difficult to find uh, shelters or transition houses. And also I understand because the workers were concerned about the residents that were already there and, and COVID, right? And, and not having enough uh, space to keep a physical distance and to keep all the protocols. And I think continues being an issue for many places. Uh, when we make the safety assessment, it's very important to gather information about the woman's partner, right? Because this is going to be key for us to understand if she's high risk. And I know that um, many of you, uh, a lot of the times are asking, how, how, when do I call the police? Should I disclose to, to the police? Uh, I think that the best thing is first to gather information and understand if he represents a high risk to her and let her know, let her know based on these factors, in, based on the information you are sharing with me, I believe you are at risk and I'm concerned for your safety. Let's make a plan whether we call the police right now or if he were to increase uh, the level of uh, abuse or violence, do you feel safe to call 911? Uh, it's very important to ask if he has access to weapons that will make him a high risk. Uh, also, what we know uh, within the safety assessment, you are going to have a number of questions, but the ones that I have lighted here is a uh, strangulation because what we know is that um, many of the women minimize that when he gets angry, he, is, uh, he gets uh, physical towards her neck and then he starts pressing her neck, right? And some women said, oh, he tried to shock me or 
but this is a sign of a, a high risk because a lot of the uh, women's homicide that has happened is because uh, he gets angry, he starts pressing her neck, and sometimes he may not have an intention to kill her, but because of the anger and his reaction, he's putting a lot of pressure on her neck, then uh, he may kill her, right? And we have heard from men who have committed a homicide, and we call it feminicide, a, that, oh, I, I, I didn't calculate, it was not my intention, right? But at the end, it's very dangerous, and, and we explain this to the woman, right? Because many women, when you ask them this question, many out of 100%, 80% of women are going to share that at least once this has happened, right? And uh, we need to share the information that this is dangerous. Also, if there are children, is a very important, uh, as you know, first for many immigrant women to understand the child protection system because many of them don't know that uh, if they are with an abusive partner who is uh, abusing her children, even though she's not the abuser, then that is considered neglect. And then sometimes she can have uh, issues with uh, child protection because they are going to. Uh, if this situation comes to their attention, they are going to come and investigate and they may ask her to leave this partner, right? So it's very important for us as workers to share as much as we can about the different legal systems in Canada, which many women don't know, right? And as you know, many of us coming from different um, countries where education was about uh, discipline and sometimes using physical violence, and that was seen as a way to discipline our children. It is very important that we share with mothers that uh, that is not a healthy way, that uh, I know many women who love their children, and, but they use this form of discipline because that's the one they learned growing up. So it's very important that we also share some education about other ways of disciplining children. And uh, therefore, if her partner is doing some emotional, uh, sexual abuse or physical harm to her children, she has the obligation to, uh, it's her responsibility to protect her children. So, it's important, uh, some of the participants were asking about what are the signs? How do we know that she's been abused, right? And as you know, uh, sometimes emotional abuse is minimized. However, out of uh, emotional abuse, physical abuse can increase, right? What, what we know is that relationships uh, don't start with just physical abuse. A lot of the times they start with isolation, right? He doesn't let her see the family, talk to friends, or even access any support. Or emotional abuse, again, uh, again calling her names, putting her down, uh, and then it goes into physical violence. But many women minimize the physical violence because maybe what they say is, yeah, for six months, he's only emotionally abusive and then um, at some point he gets angry and then he becomes physical, but then later on he asks me for forgiveness and he says that it was because he cannot find a job or because he had used alcohol and then he justifies the physical violence, but he continues the isolation and the emotional abuse, the financial abuse. So it's very important to share with women that this is a cycle, right? And that the emotional abuse, even though doesn't leave uh, visible bruises, emotional abuse has huge impacts, right? And it has long lasting effects. And we see it when we provide counseling to women that once that they leave an abusive relationship, then uh, they are so fearful, they have nightmares, 
uh, in the mental health system is called post-traumatic stress disorder, right? In our language, we just say that she has been impacted by gender-based violence and that the impacts have long-lasting effects. So also it's important to bring to her attention that maybe right now she's minimizing the emotional abuse, but that uh, this emotional abuse ha can have huge impacts on her, her children, and in her future, right? And that also what we know that we have learned through our practice, through our work and through research, is that the uh, abuse and, and physical violence escalates over the time. Uh, again, uh, some uh, in, we, women in general, uh, in my experience, uh, don't share the sexual violence or abuse that they are experiencing because of shame. And because also in the traditional ideas or cultural ideas, they have been um, forced to believe that if uh, your husband uh, sexually abuse you, then that is not sexual abuse, it's your obligation, right? That if you are a wife and is what men, when we talk about emotional abuse, is what men tell women, right? Uh, if you are my wife, you should have sex anytime and do it in any way I want because uh, you are my wife and that's your obligation, right? And sometimes it's used as a manipulation or intimidation to say, if you don't do this, I won't give you money. If you don't de do this, I'm going to get you deported. If you don't do this, I'm going to look for another woman who is better than you, and then you are nothing, right? So we have heard that all the time. And financial abuse is also important to ask her uh, if she has an account, if she has access to money, because in many situations, uh, he controls everything, even how much she spends at the store. We have cases where the woman is isolated and he doesn't let her even to go to the store, right? And he's controlling the food and controlling everything. Even if she works, sometimes he is um, getting her check and depositing the, her check in his bank account. Uh, also, it's important, again, if, we, if you remember the spiral uh, of violence, that spiral that I showed you in the beginning, it's important uh, to understand that if she has experienced abuse in childhood or growing up, or she was forced to marry uh, as a child or, or was an arranged marriage, that those are uh, things that we need to know and to bring to her attention that she doesn't have to be trapped right that maybe in her culture that is something that is considered normal but if it's creating pain and suffering to her and her children then she shouldn't be trapped with those ideas because the situation is creating pain suffering and maybe is putting her at risk So again, uh, many of the women who access our support who have a precarious immigration status, they came to Canada because uh, they were escaping also from uh, domestic violence in their country. And they may have tried to access the criminal justice system, uh, but they didn't get support or their family send them back to the person who was abusing them. So at some point they couldn't take it anymore and then they come to Canada, but they don't know that uh, they can apply and, and submit a claim as refugees because, uh, again, because as women, there is shame to disclose uh, the spiral of gender violence. There is shame to disclose that they were abused by their husband and that they escaped. So it's very important to bring to their attention that um, in Canada uh, that is considered gender persecution and that she may have a case, right? And she may have lots of evidence that can be used uh, in her situation. Uh, also, it's very important to be aware that not because we tell her to call the police, she's going to do it, that for many immigrant uh, refugee non-status women, 
their uh, experience with the criminal justice system in their countries is horrible, right? Uh, the majority of them don't trust the police because police in their countries were the ones who tortured her or putting her in a dangerous situation, or if she called, they never came. So for many women, and, and what we know for many refugee and immigrant women, calling the police is the last resort. And also, uh, you know, uh, as, as human beings who care, uh, many women don't want their partners to go through, in their heads, they think, if I call the police, they are going to torture him, and he already was torturing our country. Or if I call the police, he's going to lose his job, and it has been so hard for us as a family to find uh, uh, financial resources. And so, uh, again, for many women and many refugee and immigrant women, calling the police is the last resort. But we need to explain to them that in Canada, uh, people have rights and responsibilities. And within the criminal code, physical violence is considered an assault. And within the criminal code, uh, this kind of violence is considered a crime. And if she doesn't call the police in the moment when, when this is happening, maybe her neighbors are going to call. Maybe someone else is going to do it, right? So. Uh, and again, it has pros and cons to engage with the criminal system, but if she's uh, at risk of uh, or danger, it's important to encourage her to call 911 and to provide empathy about how we come from countries where we uh, have had bad experience with the criminal justice system. And, and in Canada, also I want to say that the criminal justice system is not perfect. There are issues I have done police complaints because police didn't follow their own protocols or their own practice. Uh, however, the majority of times when women call the police because there is domestic violence, they, the majority of times they are going to follow their protocols and interview the victim and interview the perpetrator and make decisions about a, an arrest, right? And what uh, women need to also know and understand is that he may be very uh, emotionally abusive. And if she calls the police to say he's very emotionally abusive, they are not going to do anything because within the criminal code, emotional abuse is not considered a crime. Physical abuse is considered a crime, right? So it could be that today she cannot take it anymore and she wants to call the police because today he was yelling at her and maybe putting her down, uh, making threats that he's not going to give her money anymore. Uh, and then she just decides to call the police. So it's very important that if there is past violence where he tried to strangle her or uh, he has hit her, or make threats that he is going to kill her if, if uh, she leaves, or any form of threats that put her physical safety at risk, then she is okay. She can call the police and share the history of the abuse. That's very important that she shares the history of the abuse. So then they have more evidence to take action. Uh, so when you meet with uh, your client, it's important to ask her, if she feels uh, safe to call 911, what are the barriers that she sees if she were to call 911 and to explore the fear of accessing the criminal justice system, right? So, uh, and, and to ask her what are her current safety concerns, right? If she is afraid to be deported, uh, we know in many uh, countries, uh, men make threats that they are going to send someone to kill her family. And we know, because also we have dealt with cases like that, and we had, uh, at some point, we had to work with police abroad and police in Canada because uh, there was evidence about uh, that the man had the power to do harm to her family. So uh, sometimes um, workers, frontline workers who 
are not familiar with these structures of powers in other countries, they minimize that, right? And when the woman said, oh, he's making threats that if I leave him, uh, he's going to send someone to kill my parents, then I have heard from other uh, frontline workers saying, oh, he doesn't have that power, you know, uh, don't take that serious. But I think that uh, based on our experience, we need to take serious everything he says and everything that she says and to make the best safety plan with her. Uh, also, uh, when you want to explore uh, how uh, dangerous is the relationship and what is the dynamic of abuse, it's very important to ask her uh, if violence has escalated over the time, right? And maybe again, he started just with uh, financial abuse, isolation, emotional abuse, and then recently he slapped her and he threw the food at her. But now he's making threats that if you don't do this, I'm going to do this kind of harm to you. Or even many men, which we have many cases where they say, eh, I'm going to kill you if you leave me. So saying that is considered a crime within the criminal code because that is a death threat. So you as a support worker, eh, it's important that you get familiar with the criminal code as it relates to domestic violence because uh, that's something that we can call police about and let them know that he's making the threat. And uh, for many immigrant men, uh, they are so used to make those death threats because in many countries is what they say, right? If you leave me, I'm going to kill you. And if you call the police, they won't take that serious because he's just uh, he is saying, right? But in Canada, within the criminal code, that is considered a crime. Also, it's important to ask her if he had assaulted her in the past and if she has had injuries, because that will let you know how severe is the kind of uh, physical abuse and violence that she is experiencing, right? It's very important to let her know that if at some point, some level of violence happens and she doesn't call the police, at least she goes to the doctor and she uh, keeps record of uh, the things that have happened, whether it's bruises or if there have been some injuries. Also, it's important to ask her if her partner has en been engaged with the criminal justice system uh, in the past, whether it was abroad or, or here in Canada. Uh, and also, again, if you can uh, inform yourself and learn about protection orders, right? Because sometimes police has been involved in, in maybe a domestic violence situation where they came, he were arrested, and now there is a no contact order and she doesn't know what it means, right? So it's very important that if she has a no contact order or some form of protection order that uh, she shares that with you so you can make a plan about that. Uh, and when you make a safety plan, it's very important that you make safety plans for uh, a staying because many women may not want to leave right away. And that's not the ultimate goal, you know, when, when you start working with a, a, a woman, uh, it's not that she has to leave right away. The, the goal is that she needs to learn about dynamics of violence, to understand the abuse, uh, physical violence, and the different impacts on her, and to learn about the Canadian legal system and the different options that she has in Canada. So that can help her to make decisions about leaving, right? So when you make a plan and through the tool that we have shared with you, we have different kinds of plans for when the woman decides to stay, when she decides to leave, or even we tell her, if we don't see you and uh, you decide to go back with him, it's very important that you have a plan and that you know that we are here. We are not going to have a judgment or we are not going to stop the support because I have heard from some workers that sometimes and I understand that they said, I, I get frustrated because I did 
all these things for my client. I found her at Transition House. I found her this. I, and then later on, she went back, right? But if you think about the spiral of violence, sometimes can be very scary uh, to deal with many things on her own, which she hasn't dealt with in the past. But also sometimes her partner continues making threats and at some point she gets intimidated and then she feels that she needs to go back, right? And again, it's very important that you provide information and about shelters, transition houses. Many women don't know, immigrant and refugee women think that they have to pay or that they don't know that they can be there for 30 days and that the workers at the transition house or shelters are going to help them to uh, look for a place to live. So all this kind of inform information is power, right? So it's important that the best way to support her is by providing lots of information and asking her questions about her current situation. Uh, I'm not going to go into the different plan if leaving or returning, but it's important for you to know that the tool covers uh, different questions and information that is going to help you to make those plans with her. It's important that if she's planning uh, of leaving, that she doesn't tell her children. And, and this is something that is key and I always repeat over and over because sometimes the mother start telling her uh, young children and even teenagers, oh, you know, I have a plan and next week we are leaving. Uh, so then the children tell the father, whether because they are scared of the father or because they are children, right? Uh, so what we recommend is always tell the woman that until she's in the transition house or uh, in a shelter or uh, in a safe place, then she can have a conversation with her children about this is happening for these reasons and uh, you know in the most supportive way and, and children are going to be impacted no matter what but they are already impacted by witnessing violence right so it's very important that um, the mother doesn't share her plan prior because uh, terrible things have happened because of children disclosing this information ahead of time whether the man uh, becoming very violent or uh, just keeping her from from leaving right so also uh, one more thing that we always tell women is that whenever it's possible always bring your children with you because with the family law system uh, many women when they go and ask for a custody or access or parenting time which now is known as parenting time uh, if they left the child or the children with their partner, the judge is going to say, well, if he was so dangerous, why did you leave them there, right? And then many uh, fathers, uh, sometimes they are abusive towards their children, but then when they go to court, the way that they want to control uh, the woman is by asking to keep the children or to keep them longer. And then uh, it becomes very hard for many women because then now the children are disclosing that the father is emotionally abusive, but the family court already has ordered that they should stay longer with the father, right? Uh, so we always say, whenever it's safe, always bring your children with you. And then once that you uh, get to a safe place, then you can go to the family court and then uh, expose what is the situation. And as you know, if the person is eligible for legal aid, uh, then legal aid provides a lawyer to support the woman with cases as child support, esposa support, and uh, what is called now parenting time. So uh, always uh, understand that we need to respect women's self-determination, right? So self-determination and safety are at the center and supporting our clients towards strengthening their self-determination so they can empower themselves. We, I don't like the word that we empower women because I don't, you know, I don't have that power to empower her. I have access to information, but the woman already has a lot of 
skills and strengths that we need to bring to her attention so then she can empower herself and help her family. Uh, it's very important that, as I said in the beginning, that you familiarize yourself with resources, that you listen to the woman's needs and concerns. It not make sense to you, you know? And you may say, well, you know, you shouldn't be concerned about that. That's so easy, right? But that's how she lives her life. So we need to listen to what she needs and, and uh, her fears and then help her with support and information to overcome those fears and to find the right support. If we do that, what we see at BWSS is that the majority of women who access our support, they uh, become free uh, from violence, whether because they leave that uh, abusive relationship or because there are ways in which she can uh, find access to support. So maybe the whole family becomes um, improves in, in the way that they communicate and they treat each other. And do not let culture to excuse violence in intimate relationships, because I have heard from many immigrant workers who say, yeah, you know, violence is cultural. In our culture, it's like that. I don't believe that uh, violence and pain and suffering is cultural. No one wants to suffer, no matter where you come from. So don't let culture to excuse violence. Explore with her what she needs at the moment and provide those resources. Respect her confidentiality. We have had cases where workers are working with the whole family and sometimes they disclose information with her partner that puts her at risk. So always respect her confidentiality and validate what she has done to keep her safe, safe right? So when we say, oh, I need to help her, her situation is really bad, Always remember that she has been in that relationship longer than you and that she may have done things that are very useful that have kept her safe. So explore that with her. Ensure that she understands her rights in Canada because that's key. A lot of immigrant uh, people, you know, uh, they get confused within the law in their country and in Canada, and then that creates a lot of uh, fear. Uh, ensure that she has access to interpreted, acknowledge that she understands the Cali Canadian legal system. Even if you have explained it, you may need to explain it again, right? Always, if it's possible, try to make a plan with her and follow that plan with her, right? Remember that you may be the first person in Canada that she has trusted. And uh, we say that women are the experts of their own life and their own journey, so we need to work with them. And that violence is a systemic issue. It's not that there is something wrong with her as an individual, it's that gender violence is systemic. And in the quote that was read earlier, that there is a pandemic on top of pandemic. What we have seen is that gender-based violence is uh, endemic, right? And um, I have here some link for resources. So, Thanks again for uh, listening to this presentation and I'm going to stop the sharing so uh, we can go to questions. Great. Thanks, Rosa. Um, so everyone can put your questions in the Q&A box down at the bottom. Um, and I also mentioned earlier, you can email me at refugeehub at issbc.org with your questions. Um, and on the chat box, if you open the chat box, I have put two links. Uh, Rosa did a training webinar with us in February 2019, so I have put that link. And then um, we developed a toolkit together, and she also did a training webinar in November 2019 on how to use that toolkit. And above that, I put the actual PDF link to the toolkit as well. The toolkit's really handy. Um, there's a safety assessment and also um, safety planning um, after you've done the assessment. So one question I had for you, Rosa, was what if um, uh, someone comes to a frontline worker and they haven't disclosed that they are in an abusive situation, but the frontline worker suspects because they see all the signs and they, they, they kind of have their suspicions. Like how, where do you go from there? Like how do you proceed as a frontline worker? 
Um, I think that that's a really good question because, uh, you know, the, the first uh, thing is to build trust with people, right? And uh, not because they are sitting there with us means that they trust us or that they know what they can uh, expect from us as workers. So uh, it's very important to let her know that it takes a lot of courage to access services, right? And to say, you know, I'm so glad you are here with us. It's so hard to access services and it takes a lot of courage for someone to reach out. And if, so I want to give you some information about your rights in Canada, right? And maybe to start by giving information to say, you know, I don't know if you're aware that in Canada, uh, violence against women uh, is not accepted and that there are uh, legal systems that protect women. And also what we know is that intimate violence can cause a lot of pain and suffering and can have long lasting impacts on you and your children. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you this information because it's very important that if something happens to you or you need any support, then you know that you can reach out to me, that uh, everything you share with me is confidential unless uh, I am in different protocols for different organizations. What we say is everything you share with me is confidential unless there is someone at risk to be uh, harmed, right? Um, or, or a child is at risk to be harmed. Uh, however, we always are going to work with you, letting you know this is what the steps you can take, right? So to start with that introduction and um, and you know, I have had women who have shared with me that they went to the doctor, the physician, the family doctor, and then they uh, maybe went uh, and told the physician, oh, I have been depressed, I cannot sleep, I feel so sad. And the physician just gave them antidepressants and didn't ask any questions, right? So I think it's important to, in a very um, soft and not intrusive way to say, if something is going on at home at this time and you want to talk about that, uh, I'm here to support you. If you don't want to talk about that today, but you want to come back later on, uh, I'm here to support you. And uh, it's very important that you, uh, um, that you know that I take your safety serious and that I care about your safety and the safety of your children. So uh, anything I can, do for you with information to support, I'm here. And then just leave it like that, right? But to provide information and, and repeat that because at some point people are going to disclose. They may not do it the first day, but at that moment we are opening a door. And if we made the person felt safe with us, then she's going to come back. Thank you, that's, yeah somehow creating that trust first and then um, and then moving on with the other steps, right? Um, we have a question from Jessica. It says, if it is only emotional abuse as a frontline worker, what should we do to help the client um, to create that safety plan? Um, or what is the better way to suggest what, what can we suggest the client to do? And then a part two to her question is, how can we suggest the client to collect evidence for emotional abuse? So uh, again, this is very important because I, if you think about the spiral that I show in the beginning, um, many of us uh, have uh, been trained as women to normalize violence against girls and women, right? Like, and in many countries, that thing about it's cultural, right? Like sometimes growing up in a family where the father was violent or emotionally abusive or where we were abandoned. And so, so then we tend to normalize emotional abuse, right? To say, yeah, it's the way it is and, uh, and it's going to get better. So what we have learned through our work is that when we bring to the woman's attention that these behaviors, and we describe, right? Calling you names, putting you down. So we share a, a wealth of um, a examples of situations that happen and how that is 
described as emotional abuse, right? So many of the women, when we start saying, uh, do you experience this or this? Then they said, oh, do you know my husband? He does exactly that, right? So many women have told us, I didn't know that I was uh, abused. I thought that that was a behavior that uh, is just normal, is what men do and is what happens to us. And it's just, you just have to endure that and go on because that's your responsibility as, as a woman, right? Like women have been told, that is your responsibility as a wife, as a mother, and that you are responsible to keep the family together. So then it's huge burden that they carry. So we need to support the person, in this case, the woman, to understand that it's not her responsibility, it's everybody's responsibility within the family to work towards healthy communication and towards having a way to relate with each other where there is not emotional abuse and violence. So I think that this is something that we need to repeat over and over and to share the examples. And again, because the person, the police is not going to arrest him because of the emotional abuse. Uh, then we can start getting into the conversation where, what about, uh, do you think that he's willing to access a support worker? Do you think that he's willing to go to see a counselor? Maybe he wants to learn other ways of uh, treating you as her partner, right? In our experience, a lot of men who use power and control and these different forms of abuse, they don't want to recognize that they have a problem and it's very hard to get them into counseling. Uh, but I have a, a colleague, he works with men who are mandated by the MCFD uh, to go and see him as the support worker. And he has been successful, right? And the way that he has been working with these men is through um, talking about parenting and their children and connecting with these men uh, in the way that he also investigates what was their childhood and and the values that they learn. So he has had few cases where he has been successful, but what he also has shared with me that a lot of men don't want to access the supports, right? So for the woman, she needs to understand that she may have a lot of hope that he's going to change, but also she needs to think about how long she's going to wait for that change, right? Yeah, so true. So many, so many things you said, and I was like, wow, that, <laughs> that you know, sometimes people in different cultures or even Canadian culture, it's not yeah. different cultures all the time, you know, Canadian yeah. culture too, you don't think that verbal abuse or is, is abuse or emotional abuse is abuse. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another uh, question. What happens if a victim discloses to a frontline worker about abuse in a violent relationship but she decides to stay in that relationship based on religion or cultural stigma what what can i as the frontline worker do um, to help putting in mind that she is an adult and she has the right to decide for herself which you sort of covered in your presentation but if you could yeah yeah and again eh, as you said not even in 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 other countries, like in, in Canada, with uh, even women who come from a privilege, right? Like if we think about race and class, and so women who are white, uh, middle class, heterosexual, who have jobs, uh, they also access services uh, at BWSS, right? And, and we have had women who disclosed that uh, it took them 15 years 20 years to leave an abusive partner, right? Like uh, there are many factors that uh, are there for a woman to be kept in that relationship. So uh, sometimes we can say religious factors, cultural factors, but then for example, in this case, the woman stayed for so long with the person because she grew up in a, in a family where she witnessed violence her father was violent towards the mother and the mother uh, never left. So for her, uh, it was just, this is the way it is, right? So um, it took about a year accessing services until she made the decision 
that it was not healthy for her and her children to be in that relationship. And he never hit her, but the kind of emotional abuse, it was worse than if you get hit, right? And it's what women had said. Sometimes it's better if he gives you a slap because then you know that it's abuse, right? But then a, a woman put it like, I am full of bruises inside of me, but no one can see it. So then uh, that's more painful, right? So if the person is not ready uh, to leave, that's why in the safety plan we have for staying, leaving, or returning, because it does at her own time. And um, what I said is, if there are different factors that keep her there, maybe we just have to start working step by step, right? First, we just provide information about the Canadian legal system. Then we provide information about the impacts of emotional abuse. Then we provide information that maybe within her community, which is something I did, that maybe religious uh, values or ideas keep her there, but also within the same religion beliefs or community, there are uh, other women who understand that it's not only about the religious ideas, right? It's about power and control. And it doesn't mean that she's going to lose her religion or those values, but she can connect with other women from the same community who uh, have made a change in their lives, right? So it's important to start finding ways in which we can provide the basic support. And again, uh, life is a journey and we may be just one step in that journey. We may be able to make a huge change in her life or just to plant the seed for her to continue the journey and maybe in five years she's going to leave and maybe in five years she's going to leave because you have planted the seed uh, five years before, right? 